I wish I would have known that I would have been just as good of a person, just as good as a chemist. Um, the only difference between me and myself with a bachelor's degree is that I've seen this material 10 times. Like I've, I've taught gen chem every sem or I taught gen chem or quant or organic every single semester for all of grad school. That's the only difference between me and myself with my bachelor's degree. Mm. So I think it's the imposter syndrome. I wish I would have known that you're never going to lose it. It's a mental thing. Um, no matter how educated you are, how much you learn about certain subjects, you'll never lose that. You just gotta look at yourself in the mirror and just know like you've worked so hard, you deserve this and you're just as good with or without the PhD. What are some of your biggest takeaways of working with Dr. Hill and just doing the internship in, in general? I was very lucky to work with him because he was very hands-off, where my okay. academic advisor at UNT is very hands-on. Like, neither of them would be as successful as they were if they weren't so hardworking, but they were very different approaches to how you run your lab, where at NIMS, it was more of a not an academic institution that made PhDs. It was more of a, people from all the all over the world came and did research for them and left. So it was more on your own. So I got to do things on my own. So when I was done for the day, I was done for the day. Whereas at UNT, I had this giant list of things to do and I it was never done. Um, so I kind of like took advantage of it and did as much vacationing as possible. I feel kind of guilty <laughs> I would too. Yeah. Cause like, Okay, so when you do these grants, you get paid from National Science Foundation, which is a tax, it comes out from taxpayers. So I got, I think, $5,000, $5,500 for the summer from them. They also paid for my flights there. They played for almost everything there. And then I got paid like another $5,500 from the Japanese version of NSF, so J JSPS, mm -hmm. the okay. Japanese Society for P Promotion of Science. So I got eleven grand to live in Japan. So I paid rent. I had a, I had an apartment over there too. They put me in an international apartment, which is amazing. They, I, I took Japanese oh, classes. Wow. Um, I got to learn how to put on a youth kata, which is a summer kimono. Like every opportunity they threw at me, I took, I was like, I'm never going to get an opportunity like this again. I'll do research, but when I'm not doing research, I'm going to have fun. Yeah. So yeah. My weekends, we were going in Tokyo. I went on a booze cruise and on Tokyo Bay and we got to wear our kimonos. And I, I got to hang out with um, the other Americans from, from the EPSI grant. Mm -hmm. And I also found out when I got there that this wasn't just Americans going, it was France, it was England, it was all other places that was sending students. So I got to hang out with people from Canada, people from England. So all these people coming into my little town, I hung out with them the entire summer and it was a lot of fun. I still keep in contact with them. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm sure. I've had a oh. study abroad experience. I did political science in Barcelona, so I probably didn't do it for the right reasons. But uh, it was like last night, Edgar was talking about how he hasn't studied abroad and he'd really like to travel because, you know, you haven't traveled very much uh, outside of America. And uh, it's nice to know that that's an opportunity that's still available even on, after undergrad. Yeah, I didn't do a study abroad and I really, really regret it because mm -hmm. I couldn't afford it because my I went to a private Catholic university. So it was really expensive and I didn't, I think if I would have went to like a state school, I would have gone, but I couldn't afford it. So um, I took this opportunity and ran with it. I'm like, I'm going to do whatever I would have done if I went to study abroad. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I take the opportunity. And then I had a friend who did his REU in Thailand for the summer. Um, so you can do an REU. You don't have to wait until grad school to do a study abroad. You can do it, of course, for Texas State. You can do an internship. You can do other things. Um, I think I almost helped my undergrad. She was trying to do an REU in Argentina, and she sadly didn't make it. But that was going to be really exciting. Or yeah. no, it was Chile. She was going to try to go to Chile for the summer. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I hope uh, stuff like starts opening back up when it comes to like the study abroad at Texas State. Uh, because obviously we have COVID and the pandemic right now. Uh, but I guess it's really nice to know that even if, uh, I hope, but even if, you know, things don't go back to whatever normal is when we graduate, which is scary to say that it's in two years, um, <laughs> in graduate school, you know, it, there's still that opportunity, which at some point I, I have to. I uh, My, I think, uncle uh, has gone to Germany for a study abroad that he did, 
and um, he like shows me pictures of when they went through the museums and they were at a cafe and then the scenery and I I, I want to say that France and Germany are very very big in you know chemistry because a, a bunch of chemists that we learn about and principles uh, came from France or Germany and so I feel like it'd be really nice to maybe take a study abroad summer or semester and just be in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. You date for the international ones in December, so you still have plenty of time. And yeah. majority, I know Germany is a very important part of chemistry because um, you know how English is like the main language of chemical papers right now, but mm-hmm. it used to be German. That's why. I didn't know that. Yeah. Papers, mm-hmm. if you go back from like four, 75 years ago, if you were reading the scientific articles, they'd be written in German and they need to be translated. Yeah, I tried <laughs> learning German. But it, that's so hard. <laughs> I it, there. Well, I mean, I guess it's kind of the same thing when like somebody who doesn't know English tries to learn English, which like same words mean different things and all this stuff. In in German, it was like trying to say the like the girl, the boy, had so many different ways of saying it. I was just like, oh, this is so much. Yeah, and it's gonna take a <laughs> little more than duolingo to learn German. that's true <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's the best way to learn a language but there was one more question i wanted to ask about your internship experience which was how did that um help you when you were on your journey to getting your phd i'm sure when you came back uh you probably had a huge leg up from your peers when it comes to experience and just i think about it like when edgar went to lily over the summer i feel like he has gained several very valuable experiences uh, compared to me or, or, or his peers. So if you could speak a little bit about that in your graduate school. Yeah. So it does set you apart because it gives you life experience because I like to tell my students, like people who make really good grades, that's amazing. I'm so impressed with you. But if you're someone who was like me, an average student who didn't always make good grades, you can still be set apart because sometimes it's about your life experience because it's not always about being the smartest in the room. It's about being the hardest working. And that's what a PhD means. It's that, it doesn't mean that you're smarter than everyone around you. It just means, one, you know how to find the answers, and two, that you're very hardworking. Um, that, that's what set me apart from all of my peers because going into grad school, and I know other people experience the same thing. PhDs are about failure. I'm going to be honest with you. There's lots of failure in PhDs. What you wanted to happen doesn't always happen. And that's how Nobel Prize happened. A lot of them are come from mistakes. Seriously. Yeah. Um, you got to be able to handle failure and you got to be able to handle overcoming it. So my internships really helped me prepare for that. Like you kind of get an eye on, okay, this didn't work. What am I going to do to fix this? Because that's all it is. Like, it's all about fixing mis- mistakes and, and coming around, like figuring things out. It's a, it's, it's a puzzle. That's what it is. Um, you're trying to make sense of something, a hypothesis, and trying to use these instruments or, sci- or methods to figure this out. And it's a lot of fun. Um, but that's, that's what those internships helped me do because I wasn't just a 4.0 student coming in. I wasn't someone who on paper was just fantastic. And I just knew that that someone that was looking for these better colleges, because I think I applied for a few. I, I tried to go to University of Oregon, and they were like, no, she's not good enough. Don't accept her. And the ones that did look past my GPA and saw that I had good life experience and um, I was a very hard worker were like, okay, let's have her come. Let's 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 do that because it's, she's worth the chance. So I, I guess if you're someone like me who is more of an average student, um, this will give you some life experience and when you hit grad school, like I know I went to grad school and not everyone I went with had the internships under their belt or had any working experience. Like I started working when I was 14, like people who don't know how to work hard and just know how to study, like that is working hard. Don't get me wrong, but there's a difference between studying and working physically. So when I got to grad school and like, I knew how to crunch and like just you stay there till you work until it's done it's not about okay it's 5 p.m let me go home no you stay until it's done that's kind of what set me apart like um and I'll, I'll be honest sometimes it's it's the culture too some cultures are just harder workers like i'll be honest americans are not as hard workers as other cultures like <laughs> people who come from from china like all my friends from china all my friends from india such harder workers um i think there's just more pressure on you when you're an international student whereas if you don't work as hard as the professor wants you to there's this big thinking about it like they're going to deport me so they they work a lot harder which is why there's a little bit of um 
it's not good for your mental state yeah. when you do that. So I don't, I, I, I think they are harder workers, but I think there's more pressure as an international student. It's not fair. And I don't agree with that at all. Yeah, I can definitely uh, agree with that because I know even um, when I was in high school, uh, I went to high school in South Texas, which is predominantly Hispanic. Um, you, you could tell. You could tell who was the hard worker uh, and you could tell who uh, got things handed to them. Uh, I guess put it in the nicest way. Uh, mm-hmm. Even kind of like growing up, um, and Nick, you can ask uh, our roommate Silva, um, he's such a hard, hard worker and and so is our other roommate Izzy and so am I and honestly all four of us and I think it's because when growing up, I'll take myself as an example, I didn't have much to work with. And so whatever we had, we had to make it work. And so having that life experience early on and then, you know, fast forward to when you're in high school and you're presented with these math problems or science problems or having to analyze a lecture or something like that. It's kind of you have that mentality already of, okay, well, I have to do this because this is my duty. This is what I'm here for. This is, you know, so and so and so. And I feel like other people who might not have had that experience before don't have that mentality in them yet which you can definitely acquire but i think it's definitely a benefit from i guess having that uh heart uh upbringing that some people might not have yeah i'm very fortunate that like my upbringing was not as hard but um my it's because of my dad's upbringing like my mom and my dad's upbringing that they kind of were like you're gonna have it much better than we had it but we want you to understand what we went through so i got very lucky there so I can't really say I had a hard upbringing, but they did instill like, you're going to work hard to get what you want in life. Um, and, yeah. uh, people who haven't experienced that, like the ones that started grad school with me, they definitely like didn't start strong right away, but they caught up real quick. Like yeah. they, they're just as successful, even sometimes even more, they're incredible students still. Yeah. I think as long as you pick that mentality up at some point or that you're at least aware that, uh, it's not everything just hits handed. You know, sometimes you do have to put in that extra mile of work. You do have to do 120%. Um, I think as long as at some point in life you have that realization, you'll be successful. It doesn't matter if it's when you're five or if it's when you're 40. Yeah. It's like when you have it, I, f- I feel like life itself just changes. It really does, and it makes everything, I guess, smoother. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so you earned your PhD in 2019, right? almost two years ago. Uh, congratulations. And now you're a lecturer at Texas State University. But I understand that you were actually deciding between some other opportunities after your PhD as well. Could you speak on those a little bit? Yeah, um, I'm gonna be honest, if you are someone who is ready to look for jobs, the best thing you can do is not limit yourself. Um, don't limit yourself to a field. Don't limit yourself to an area. Don't limit to yourself to prices or pay. Uh, because the, the second you start limiting yourself, the longer it takes you to get a job. So I don't think that everyone needs to get a PhD. And, I, and that's for, that could be a different talk where it's like, it's not that I think a PhD is above people or people shouldn't get it. It's that it's a lot of extra work that doesn't always have the best payout. Um, so if you can save yourself some mental pain, because let's be real PhD process in America needs a lot of work with the mental fairness to the grad students. It kind of is like a lot of work for no pay and it's not always as fair. I mean, it's not good on your mental psyche. Um, so that's why I say like, if you are at any time unsure, it's still, you know, with your bachelor's or you get a job, um, sorry, I kind of forgot the question. (laughs) Could you repeat it? the opportunities you were considering after getting your PhD. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, so no worries. That's what I mean by like, don't limit yourself because mm-hmm. if you, what I did was when I was graduating, I think I applied to like 200 jobs in like a month. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. And I did the same thing with my bachelor's degree. Like the okay. second I thought I was graduating and I really want to talk to y'all about this because it takes time and you got it. Mm-hmm. You can't just get your bachelor's degree and then the next day start applying and have a job in the next week. It takes time. Mm. And the second you start getting jobs that requires background checks and drug tests and physical tests, it requires a lot more time to get in. So if you know you're graduating in May, start applying for jobs in March or even earlier. Um, 
So I started applying, I wrote my, my, my dissertation, I put it on my advisor's desk, and then I started applying in May. And I applied anywhere and everywhere. And I applied all over the country. I even applied in Canada. I was just like, just hire me, please. Mm. Um, and so I think I had three job interviews and my advisor was not allowing me to graduate on time unless I had a job. So I was very fortunate to Texas State liked my interview enough to offer me a job in July. And so I was just like, okay, I want, I want a job. I want this job. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> And then I, mean, I just this is, weeks later. Yeah. I was gonna say, so this is July of 2019. Last year, yeah. Yeah, so it's it, it's very recent. Yes, I I defended my dissertation, so I got my PhD. I guess I guess there's a weird thing. It's like, do you get your PhD when you defend, or you get your PhD when you get? Yeah, your Yeah, that's true. So I def- I think it's when you defend. So I, I defended. I got the job offer July 1st. I defended July 22nd, and I moved out here like August 8th. It was real quick. Uh-huh. But I knew I needed the job to graduate. My boss was never going to let me graduate until I had a job. And so um, I had the paper, the job offer. I put it on his desk and said, let's schedule a date now. And so I was like, bye. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. While all this is happening and you just said, uh, I think the dates you gave was July 1st, offer July 22nd, defended. <laughs> and then August 8th, you were here. I was doing research at Texas State. <laughs> it was that that summer I was doing the Sure program, and I think I left uh, back to McAllen. I think it was like August seventh, August eighth. Yeah, oh, it was that's fast. pretty cool. Yeah, I was like let's do it. I just gotta. That's why it's like if you don't limit. Like I understand that some people are married with kids. Some people have to be around their family. Some people have reasons to limit themselves. But also don't limit to yourself to types of jobs. Like I always knew I wanted to go back into industry. But industry takes time to get into. You have to do a background check. You have to do your initial. um, You have to do your initial application. You have to do a phone interview. You have to do an aptitude test. You have to do physical tests, drug tests. Um, You have to do all this other stuff. So it takes like five months to even go from day to application to first day of work. And so Hmm. I didn't have that kind of time. And I was very fortunate to get offered this job. And I love my job. Very appreciate it. It worked out really well. Um, so that was another thing that limited me. So I didn't just apply to industry. I applied to this kind of jobs. I did quality control. I did, I even applied for engineering jobs. Um, so I even, I think anything was looking for a PhD in science. I was like, I'll just apply. I have a chemistry PhD. I'll apply. I even did it for a job of PhD in math. I didn't get accepted, but <laughs> so you get my point. Uh, yeah. So I'll also offer this wherever you go to school, you have people who will do this for free. They will look at your resume for free and edit it for you, and they will get you a cover letter for free. So you need to write a rough draft and then go to the career services at Texas State, and they will edit it for free. And even when you're an um, alumni, they will do it for free. Wow. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Because yeah. I was going to ask, how does like your graduate school help you get into a career or into a, in the workforce? Like, How do they help you? find a job and actually do something with your degree it depends on your advisor um i feel like with myself i had to do it on my own Mm -hmm. but some advisors straight up put you right into the right into the uh the job so there are some people that i worked with that didn't do more academic they did more career-based where they made patents or they did industry type things so one of our professors majority of his students go straight into intel And he sends them out to Arizona. And so all of them, Intel, Intel, Intel. Another one of our professors, um, Dr. Hoffman's advisor, he has a lot of students that go directly into industry, whether it be um, working for companies that make mass specs. So they would be like the people who help do that or like they have connections. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they can get you a job directly with your networking skills. Uh, Um, I was going to say, Dr. Hoffman, I think when, when I was working with him, he told me about how... I think oh, I don't want to get this wrong, but at some point uh, after his uh, graduate studies, he worked for a company and they were, uh, I can't remember what they were making specific, but he told us a little bit about how like industry is and how it's different from, you know, being at an institution. And I remember talking about, uh, which this again, this is a whole talk in itself, but uh, how money and, you know, uh, even working with, with Lily, uh, if I needed something, I would just go grab it. But working in, you know, a lab at Texas State, if I needed something, well, do you really need it? Well, how much do you need? 
and you know everything is so much more counted and asked for and all that stuff but i i do see how like it's very beneficial to have that advisor of oh well this is already there so go ahead yeah yeah i think a lot of i guess it's just a lot of careers it's who you know and i knew that i don't really want to rely on like who i know to get a job but let's be honest here sometimes it really is necessary like I, I didn't get my job at Dow because of who, my, who knew my parents or my grandparents. I got it directly on my own shoulders. And that is a lot of honor in that. But once you start meeting more people, meeting different universities or knowing connections, like uh, recently I was meeting with Dr. Um, I think, is his name Mamiya? Dr. Blaine Mamiya? Oh, Mamiya. So, yeah, he would talk to me about one of the professors at UNT that he knew personally. So it's like sometimes it's like, what if I was at UNT and I just broke all my bridges and so I'm applying for jobs here and they're like well let's talk about Dr. Weber and that professor's like do not hire her like it's sad to say but it's you got to be very careful yeah and it's not always a bad thing it's just it's sometimes who you know like if you were a really hardworking student you worked with a bunch of people and they're like you want to hire her you hire her like they'll have good things to say too uh so I guess after like starting with your undergrad it's all about networking and who you know and in where they're going in life because i have friends all over the country and the world that i can call up and use connections there to you know talk about things like that it's really quite awesome <laughs> that's so cool mm-hmm. i'm sure your network really expanded in japan uh yes. with that international you know dormitory or wherever you were staying the university um very cool so currently you are the jan chem 2 lab coordinator and the chemistry for engineers lab coordinator and then uh, your actor's professor uh, the quantitative analysis uh, professor as well um, how has like the labs for gen chem 2 changed since you've started uh, being the coordinator because I know the first time I heard of you uh, it was it was I watched a YouTube video of one of the labs that you and Dr. Vince Aguero made uh, honestly one of the most entertaining forms of content that I've seen from a professor uh, and, and it, it was informational. I, I actually got through that lab. I think it was the electrochemistry lab. I don't remember what it was. Uh, oh gosh, that was me. Okay. I was gonna say like, I can't <laughs> take any credit cause Dr. V is very, very, very creative uh-huh. and she does a great job of making videos more entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas me, I'm more bland. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, let's do these intro videos. Let's do like these cool, like going uh-huh. from one slide to the other, let's add sound. And that's, that's all her, um, pretty much. I'm not really coming up with these really cool ideas. Dr. V and Dr. Patterson, Dr. MJ Patterson have um, created this lab manual that they've been working so hard on. And all I've been really helping out was just, um, well, COVID kind of ruined that, but we've been trying to like make more videos to these labs and trying to make these labs more doable because we find that I don't want, I'm not an event, but like we find that students aren't really knowing what they're doing when they get to lab. And some mm-hmm. universities are like, okay, write your pre-lab before coming, but still the students don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. And so we're trying to come up with ways to help the students know what they're doing because I don't know. I feel like when I was in y'all's shoes, like an undergrad, like I didn't know what I was doing for half the labs, but I didn't, I didn't enjoy them. But the mm-hmm. second I knew the big picture of what I was doing, I'm like, this is fun. This makes sense. I'm doing this, 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 to get this. So it's more of like, I understand that you're not going to love every second of being in lab, but knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it might make the lab more successful. And so that's what we're trying to do with Gen Chem 2 and make it more organized and just clear for the students. It's just been hard having the online part of it. And then for engineering, we are starting from scratch. This semester, it's not going to be started from scratch, but the goal is, is to develop a lab that can help our engineering students that does a little bit between chemistry and engineering. So I think Mm -hmm. we're going to, maybe in the next year, we're going to rewrite all the labs to have them do completely different things. Engineering Mm -hmm. based. Yeah. Yeah. I I can add a little bit on the, uh, what you said about knowing what you're doing actually makes it enjoyable. I a hundred percent agree. When I was in, um, OCHEM one and two, um, I mean, going from chemistry that's so math heavy and then no calculator. It's just you're drawing everything uh, can definitely be 
a hard transition to make. But once I started, uh, Dr. Allison was, is and was a, a great professor for us. I think I think we both had him, right, Nick? Yeah. Um, yes. He he really related what we were doing to why it's important and you know why are we learning about this? And even in the lab, one of the Oakham two labs that we had was we were making like banana oil with like uh doing some ester like chemistry or something like that i don't remember completely but it was like the whole lab smelled like banana and it it was it was so cool but knowing why it smelled like bananas was cool and it actually made it enjoyable and um i have the manual somewhere but it was like a chart of uh what banana oil looked like the compound and if there was one less oxygen then it became rum but if there was like three more oxygens, it became something else. And it was like, everything was just making more sense. And it made me look forward to doing the lab. So I, I can definitely agree on that. Um, and there was something else that you touched on that I forgot. You said something after the... Oh, I'm going blank right now. Do that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can echo the knowing what you're doing before lab part. I didn't really figure that out until Ochem Lab. And that was honestly because they made us write the whole lab report beforehand. And I think that had a lot to do with, you know, being prepared. Because, you know, in Gen Chem, you could easily highlight the bolded words and get away with it, a good grade on the quiz. Uh, but I think stuff like having a quiz at the beginning of the lab is really important so that they are forced to learn it. Hopefully, they're forced to, to learn it that way. Um, I, I always thought, like, why don't they make you write the lab report for Gen Chem? Because I think that was always, like, I, I felt cool because I was, like, writing it for myself instead of just reading somebody else's lab report or, or lab manual for me. Um, I could interpret it as my own. And another complaint about Gen Chem labs is that sometimes they take forever and, you know, it's really, you know, people might get lost or they're, they're not good direction or whatever, but that's mostly a fault of just not being prepared beforehand because if you really prepare you can get in and out of there on most of the labs in like an hour and a half uh on average uh and then the rest of the time for the lab is yours so a lot of it is being prepared ahead and i wish i did knew that i know that when i was in in my gen chem labs and unfortunately my ochem labs the second half of ochem one and ochem two were completely online so yeah. i am kind of craving some actual in lab experience now yeah, I really enjoyed Ochem Labs. Those were a lot of fun. We made aspirin. We did a lot of cool things. Um, I was supposed to make aspirin, and COVID came in. Yeah. Aspirin one looked pretty cool in the module online, though. Lab workflow, I think. Yeah. Um, well, we, we covered a lot already. Um, I did want to ask one last question, which is, you know, what do you wish you would have known before you decided to take this journey and get your PhD? Um, I wish I would have known that getting a PhD won't make you a chemist or it won't make mm -hmm. you, it, I feel like I, I'm very honored to have a PhD. I'm very honored to be known as Dr. Weber. Like I know I worked really hard and I'm happy about that, but there of course is a little ego involved in a lot of PhDs. So, like there's a difference between like master's PhD and bachelor's, but what I wish I would have known is that I would have been just as capable without it. Um, mm -hmm. I I, I wish I would have known that I would have been just as good of a person, just as good as a chemist. Um, the only difference between me and myself with a bachelor's degree is that I've seen this material 10 times. Like I've, I've taught gen chem every sem or I taught gen chem or quant or organic every single semester for all of grad school. That's the only difference between me and myself with my bachelor's degree. Mm. So I think it's the imposter syndrome. I wish I would have known that you're never going to lose it. It's a mental thing. Um, no matter how educated you are, how much you learn about certain subjects, you'll never lose that. You just gotta look at yourself in the mirror and just know like you've worked so hard, you deserve this and you're just as good with or without the PhD. Um, and then also I kind of am curious where I would have been if I didn't get the PhD. Like I'm very thankful I did because it's given me the self-esteem that I think I needed, like working at Dow, like, of course I was the only person with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry there, are even mostly chemistry. I was just missing one class. So like I was set apart from everyone else I worked with who didn't have any chemical experience in the lab. Like my bosses, they were. They, that was the next step for me. So I'm curious, where would I be now if I just would have waited a little bit longer and saw what would have happened? Like, I don't regret anything, but I'm curious, where would I be? 
Hmm. Dr. Weber, thank you so much for doing <laughs> this. You are the first professor of many that we hope to have on the podcast. Um, I know a lot of students really like you because you're very approachable and, and in some ways very relatable as well. Uh, I think you said many things that a lot of students are going to take away from this. So really appreciate you uh, being here. Edgar, is there anything else you wanted to, to finish off the podcast with? I just love how relatable a person can be especially you because as undergrad students that you know we're we're doing our undergrad work right now um uh, sometimes uh, i can speak personally it feels like i'm working towards something that i don't know and yeah. because it's i you know yeah i'm working towards a chemistry degree but then what is it graduate school is it workforce is it masters is, is, you, know, you know there's there's so many questions now and I definitely wish that uh, even coming into college, uh, even look, when I was in high school going into undergrad, uh, I wish I had someone there to tell me, well, if you do this, these are the possibilities. It's not just you're going in one direction. There's more than you know. And in any anything, having somebody relate, you know, have, sorry, so having somebody who's already gone through, you know, their path, and then them being able to share that path with other people is amazing. And the fact that we can have you here, hopefully the students that hear this podcast uh, get something out of it. Even if it's just a snippet, that's why we do this podcast. That's that's the purpose of it. So I'm really glad that you were able to make it. Thank you for having me. I hope that over time where you have all, all the other professors and, of course, if you get other people from different industries and different walks mm. of life, like... I think that's something that I would have, it would have been very useful for me because I know I've told you this over and over again. Like I just got so sick of the question, what are you going to do with your chemistry degree? What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with your life? You don't know. Like I still kind of don't know what I want to do with my life. Like it's something that's always going to be there. It's always going to be the unknown. Um, but I just, I'm here to tell you that you have so many options. Um, so yeah, y'all are going to be great. I'm just so proud of my students and I hope that I can just, take my life experiences and just help y'all, I guess, guide y'all in a direction to let y'all know that infinite opportunity. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.